Universal basic income and the end of the republic. This is a column on thehill.com. I didn't I didn't mean to say it that way. A column on the hill. Has a nice ring to it. Someone should do a blog by that name. Chris Talgo, opinion contributor. You had the original announcement of this bill was not just that it was two thousand dollars a month for any American making under one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, which which by itself sounds doable, but still you're going you're you're stepping on the gas, driving us over the cliff. But it's it's not even just that. It's two thousand dollars for you, your spouse, and two thousand dollars for each of up to three children. Ten thousand dollars. That's now that's the proposal that is seriously being worked through Congress. I don't think that's going to pass. But that's how far we've come. Now, yesterday, uh, one of the stories we covered was socialism has lost its bite as a term right that they, thanks to bernie sanders perhaps but just in general it's not and and intellectually i think this is a good thing like the the, the, the fear mongering around any you're a socialist you're a communist like okay so you're confused you're you know, like it worse like let's if your ideas are better present them like you know give us an, an, an honest debate that uh you know this pejorative label lynching so the fact that the the thing that that's a reflection of isn't that american conversation suddenly got way nicer or that that bernie sanders brought a new level of civility to the political dialogue or you know Donald Trump, cheeto jesus need i say more um but that, that socialism has become truly normalized the d debate now in the face of coronaphobia is not, should there be government relief to corporations and individuals, which inevitably means the system will be very smooth at giving out the money to corporations and it will be incredibly disproportionate. And then when it comes to individuals, as we've seen already with our $1,200 coronaphobia bonus checks, taxpayer rebates, whatever you want to call them, get yours. We're going to come back to that. That you know, this is, how, how many people have gotten there? I, I'll ask to the comments here, you know, first question of the day uh, has and I've heard that some people who I got actually I want to give a shout out to the to, to anonymously. Uh, there was someone who said they weren't asking for the check. They didn't want it, but it came anyway. <laughs> like it, it came by direct deposit anyway, just last week. And I think mine came two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and that was that was already the second batch. And there's still there are going to be people missing it and fighting for it, and it's just they're borrowing six thousand dollars in your name on average for every single American, and giving you some of you twelve hundred dollars back. Where does that the rest of that money go? Their corporate sponsors, the banking class. No question here. So to the to the comments, how many people got their checks? If if, if you were going to get one you know give us what's what your what is your status in relationship to your twelve hundred dollar coronaphobia rebate so the socialism is the norm and i hate hearing republicans uh, pretend to be conservative they are not in even by any honest definition of the word conservative uh, what they are doing i mean okay maybe one definition to to conserve existing social institutions one definition of conservative if that's the case they are absolutely in favor of conserving our current state of socialism. Of, of I, I, You've heard me rant on that enough. If you don't know how far into socialism we are in this country with social security, Medicare, Medicaid, social, I, I, I'll stop myself there. Those, those are the big obvious ones. But everything that government has a monopoly or quasi-monopoly or major financial role in is um, a, a form of socialism. And it's, it is a matter of degrees. And yeah, it, it, it's laughable to think that any Republican in Congress is, is in any meaningful way. I guess Thomas Massey, I got to give a shout out to Thomas Massey, the one exception. 
or doing his, his darndest as an individual to stand in the way of the stimulus package as the one objecting vote calling for a roll call when everybody else wanted to pass it by unanimous consent. So when I, and the title of today's podcast, UBI and the end of government as we know it is a deliberate adaptation of this column, universal basic income and the end of the Republic. I, I am not in favor of maintaining such a large centralized government as we have in the Republic today. And it's not really a Republic. The Republic is supposed to be a confederacy of sovereign states. We clearly have distinct subsidiaries in states and counties and city governments and parishes and so on. But are they sovereign states come together in a union or are we one governmental structure with some subsidiary geographical subunits? I think the second is a, is a much more accurate description. So the end of government as we know it. Not only is this going to drive polarization, as we covered in yesterday's podcast, the bifurcation of the economy, the blowing up of the black market. And I, the, today's opening segment could be seen as a, a sequel to that because there's so much to unpack economically to understand what's going on here. So back to the column. Since the onslaught of shutdowns to flatten the curve and prevent the nation's healthcare system from being overwhelmed, more than 30 million Mar Americans have lost their jobs. The unemployment rate has skyrocketed to 14.7%. Families throughout the United States are struggling to buy food and pay their bills because the government will not let them return to work. I just I love the accuracy of this compared to most of what we're hearing in the mainstream media. Obviously, this is an opinion poll, and I, I do I, I want to I want to again point out that this is uh, Chris Talgo, and uh, the the difference in the honest language here is that he's not blaming the coronavirus. It's because the government will not let them return to work. Nothing with the virus justifies any of the shutdowns whatsoever. You as an individual, first of all, because you as an individual have a right to determine your own level of risk in interacting with the rest of the great human petri dish. You have the right to stay home. You have the right to go out with masks and gloves. You have the right to maintain social distancing. And if that's the new norm, that's great. And for government, if there's anything for the authority to step in and do here, and I wouldn't want it to be government, of course, but it, even at the community level would be to say, look, if you hold a concert now, and we got a great story in, in today's show about a uh, concert happening or not. Uh, so, yeah, uh, very interesting where this is going with people fighting back against the lockdown. It's beautiful to see that nearly every American, or I should say nearly, nearly but the majority, uh, the, the majority, a clear majority, I mean, 60, 70 percent uh, of Americans are in some way civil disobedience activists right now. Like, it's a beautiful thing to see. And that's only if only by default. I mean, half the country's civil disobedience activists completely unintentionally because they can't do anything other than completely stay at home and go nowhere and talk to no one without violating one order or another because they've been living under contradicting orders from federal authorities, state authorities, county and even city authorities with different policies. So one more thing about this unemployment issue first, this you know, clearly understanding that this is a forced unemployment crisis. That is that is the meat of what we are dealing with right here. 14% unemployment, that's the government number. Now, if I recall, to so a little more background for the segment, when they calculate the unemployment numbers, they drop anybody off who's not actively looking for work. So if you've given up, so when they started with whatever they said unemployment was at the beginning of this crisis and it blew up to this, there's there's a shadow stat behind it. There's a, a whole other, uh, there's a whole other number, like a demographic of people that just aren't being counted in this at all. So when they say 14%, I remember, you know, when I was, uh, studying this when it was like around 8%, some estimates said, you know, hypothetically it's as high as 25%. And, and, and that might be really including people that should be dropped off. But it, it was some multiple more. Now, is it some multiple of 14%? No, but it didn't go from bad to worse. It went from worse than they were telling you 
to much shittier than they're even admitting now. So that's my point there. To date, Congress has allocated more than $2.4 trillion in coronavirus-related economic aid from the CARES Act to the Paycheck Protection Program. Congress has tried to keep businesses afloat and employees on payrolls, obviously. As the most recent unemployment report shows, this stopgap strategy is not working. Perhaps we should pause and reassess the necessity of the draconian shutdown strategy. After all, we have flattened the curve, and at this point, it does not seem that healthcare facilities are in danger of being overrun. Would it make a lot of sense to focus on how to safely open the economy so Americans return to work and retain their self-reliance? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm a little disapp disappointed the author doesn't like really hit back harder, more direct on the hoax. Remember, this is a hoax. The, 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 the coronavirus, the idea that coronavirus, which is a, a truly real pandemic, is anything more than, than, than another barely special bug in, in the global human petri dish it is a hoax, that it justifies any uh, uh, of these abnormal reactions. And, and they first justify this. Remember, like, think back just a couple months here. How did they scare us into this lockdown? They said it was going to be 2 million dead. 2 million. Two million. What are the numbers they're fighting over now? Trump's official number, and he's trying to blow it up from, but it came down to like 60 to 80. And now it's 80 to 90. And you, someone, you got to step back and be like, this is all bullshit. This is all bullshit. Like, really, and, and even, even now, the worst case scenario that they're, they're talking about puts it in the realm of less harmful than the flu. It's a funky off-season flu-like virus. That that is, I don't want to say it. the science is clear, but that is obvious to anybody who who can question these numbers and analyze them properly. That there's no greater threat here. And, and just to, it, it is it is maddening, absolutely maddening when you when you see this because the second what was the second thing they did. Right, well, we can stay at home, or you know, you know even, even if the death rate's really low, what, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to flatten the curve? Hospitals could be overrun. I don't even see that bullshit in the mainstream. They're not even trying anymore. Because how did they do this? They had one shot from one room in a hospital in Italy with about a dozen, maybe 20 patients on ventilators. Then they had in New York their emergency hospital tent whatever like in some subway station they got tent, and they had just cubicles of, of, of hospital cells you know beds laid out right empty never saw a picture of them with any patients in them now i i don't know i've asked my audience to challenge me on this you know our we we had the you know hashtag film your hospital and yeah there was a lot of controversy around that I think once you start something like that, there are going to be people trolling it from both sides, trying to discredit it. But the point was made. And I've been, incidentally, to uh, to two different hospitals during during this time. Not overrun. Not even close. They got tents set up outside. They, in fact, what they've been telling us is that things are slow still overall because of all of the elective procedures that have been pushed back. I mean, the, dam the, the, the irony that the, uh, uh, the damage that this is doing to the healthcare infrastructure in this country by putting so many healthcare workers out of work and, and making it difficult to bring them back. I mean, it's, it's not just that easy. So back to the UBI here. American history is full of examples of government programs that were intended to be temporary and continue to this day. In fact, several provisional measures and programs enacted during the Great Depression are still in place today. A cynic might say that some Democrats are using the coronavirus crisis as an opportunity to push their progressive agenda. For years, many on the far left have advocated for monthly government programs in the form of universal basic income. Andrew Yang, a contender for the Democratic Party's 2020 presidential nomination, made the UBI a pivotal part of his campaign and received lots of attention and acclaim for doing so. Remember the Yang gang? Moreover, the Green New Deal, a wish list of the far left, contains a UBI to provide, quote, economic security for all who are unable or unwilling to work. So 
Keep in mind, all of this fervor over the UBI and far left circles predated the COVID-19 pandemic by a few years, at least. So given the historical context, is it such a logical leap to assume that some on the left are using the coronavirus crisis as an opportunity to introduce another temporary welfare program that is almost assuredly going to be popular among Americans who receive it? Benjamin Franklin, Franklin reportedly said, quote, when the people find that they can vote themselves money, that will herald the end of the Republic. You guys like my Benjamin Franklin impersonation? I, I got that from all, all of his, you know, the podcasts that he did. I think it's a pretty good one. Could a UBI in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic inadvertently lead to this nightmare scenario? And so this is somewhat of a competition between the engineers of the system, the inevitable reality of an unsustainable system, and the explosion of the bifurcated economy, the, the black market. And I encourage everybody to be more conscientious as agorists. Uh, agorism, uh, a term created by Sam Ed Conkin III, is the idea of conducting your economic affairs outside of the purview of government, working under the table, not contributing in any way materially to government, so doing everything that you can to rearrange your economic affairs to not be paying taxes, or at least as little as you practically can. Now, this tension could be seen in this next story from ZeroHedge.com. One bank explains why QE no longer stimulates the economy and only leads to higher stock prices. That's quantitative easing. We brought you the story about why stock market uh, prices or stock prices are, uh, are rallying while the rest of the economy is in shambles. And we are getting deeper into this topic now. With some great insight from none other than Tyler Durden himself. Even some of the most ardent supporters of the fraud that is Keynesian economics now admit the entire modern economic system is on the verge of collapse for one main reason. The marginal utility of debt is collapsing with ever more debt required to generate an increase in underlying GDP. The chart here, latest evidence of diminishing returns GDP generating capacity of global debt. You know what? I, let's skip this chart just to the next part. And tied to that is another reason why any day now the current system may be the last. The marginal utility of every new QE is now declining to the point where soon virtually none of the money created by the Fed out of thin air will enter the economy and instead will be stuck in capital markets, resulting in hyperinflation for asset prices. For, uh, excuse me, hyperinflation. I get so excited resulting in hyperinflation for asset prices, even as the broader economy collapses. Or as BMO's Daniel Prieter writes, QE is fed through the real economy in a slower manner than previous QE campaigns. And for each dollar the Fed's balance sheet has grown, M1 money supply has increased about 32 cents compared to 96 cents and 74 cents in QE1 and QE2. The expansionary policy thus far has mostly resulted in increased asset prices. So let's see if I can unpack all of this into layman's terms that, that I would have understood before I read Ron Paul's and the Fed. So quantitative easing is their uh, bullshit propaganda term for creating more money out of thin air. And what they mean is that each dollar on the Fed's balance sheet, that means that the Fed has lent money to the banks. What has it led to in the M1 money supply? Well, M1 money supply is the money in circulation. So when it comes to what you had in Q1, QE1 and QE2, I think the first one was around the uh, the recession of 2008, 2009, and, and the housing bubble collapse. And so what they're saying is that back then, when they created that much money, 96 cents of a, out of every dollar found its way into the economy or actually into a, a broader market and market effects, 74 cents in the last one. Now, this is actually really shocking, down to 32 cents at this point. So this is actually a really interesting sign. If you look at this sort of from a detached economic perspective and, and you go, okay, well, they're printing more money. How much of it is actually, like how much of it is actually trickling down? And is this intentional or not? Like, obviously it's not unintentional in the sense that, oh, whoops, we didn't mean to do that. Like, but is this, for them, is this a side effect or is this, you know, part of the desired effect? Is it just like, hey guys, guess what? Remember when you printed all that money before? 
and we skimmed four cents of every dollar off the top. Check this out. Now we're going to be skimming 68 cents off the top of every dollar. Like, it's not as simple as that. But, but it could be described that way in the bigger picture to say, yes, this money is not trickling down. So to the next story from the Zero Government blog, just kind of aside from my friend Jim Davies, he says, perhaps I missed news of the odd half trillion, but if not some two and a half trillion dollars is being fabricated now in the FedGov's magic money printing office and shipped out to eager recipients. What a gift. Isn't government great? Why not do this every work, every week? It sure beats working. My share is $1,200, but I'll not be applying. If you were hit hard by the bogus plague, or rather by the government lockdown that used it for an excuse and wasn't bogus at all, I'll not blame you for accepting the goodie. They caused your loss, so they should repair the damage. The only trouble is that those who did the wrecking won't be paying the tab. They will just force our children and grandchildren to pick it up unless you get busy with the TOLFA method and put them out of business first. Another option is to accept the offer, but pay it over to one's children, since in due course, they'll be losing it again. Possibly they'll be able to invest it in the meanwhile, and so turn it into something useful. The stock market should pick up quite well after the government has lifted all its restrictions, and if in a year or two the Dow recovers from 24,000 to 30,000 again, that 25% gain could be handy. I'm I'm more Jim in favor of the idea that this is uh, we need to fight for a whole new system. I, you know that I, I hate to say the uh, again the appeal to the collapsitarian in me here, but yes, it, it is the untenability of the current system. I I, I don't want to collapse in the sense that. You know that, that, that any any unnecessary human suffering should occur in the transition to free market money to a voluntary society, but a, uh, a significant economic upheaval. Uh, you know, I mean, they they just keep ratcheting it up, and I don't want to be a uh, I, I don't want to be a boy cried wolf kind of guy because you know since the Federal Reserve uh, was taken off the gold standard in, in 1971. People have been saying, the, the dollar's about to crash, gold is about to go sky high, you know, and, and it's like, well, yeah, okay, chicken little. But now, I've, I, and I've, I've, I've maintained this position. I mean, I, I suppose my first few years as an activist, I kind of fell for the sky is falling rhetoric. But for most of the last 14 years, I've been saying, no, like they, they have the best mathematicians money can buy. They're going to engineer it. This is not going to be the collapse. But now perhaps things are, things, this is this is the black swan. Things, yeah. things are shaking up truly uniquely now. And I'm not, you know, here to say, like, this is, you better be on my email list now because if you don't, you might miss my stock picks coming up and, you know, or, Buy my gold or silver, you know, or, or or you know, my crypto or anything like that. I don't have any particular stake in, in any of those things. But pay attention. Things things are shifting really fast. Jim also says a third option exists, accept it, but if it's not truly needed, give it away to some deserving cause, one such as Adam Kokesh, who to, hopes to be elected president and then abolish the Fed Gov. Now that's a really deserving cause. Thank you, Jim Davies. Now back to Tyler Durden. Stocks tumble as Tepper says market most overvalued since the bubble of 1999. So the point I, I, I want to underline here is that not only is the stock market generally a casino where the house always wins and your retirement portfolio always loses, or at least on the whole, as we know how the manipulation goes, you wake up one day and the money just isn't there in your account anymore. But that the whole thing is a bubble. The, the, the money, as, as we told you in this, in the other story about how the money is not trickling down, when it means that it inflates these asset classes, that's it, it, the stock market, that's commodities. That's everything that that money goes to before it gets anywhere near, you know, an independent individual actor or, you know, the, the bottom of the economic ladder, so to speak. 
which means that this whole thing is very, very fragile right now. On a day when the market commentary of big rich guy investors has earned a public review from the president himself, we suspect more than the usual number of viewers tuned in to hear David Tepper, the founder of hedge fund Appaloosa Management and owner of the Carolina Panthers dur during a noontime interview on CNBC Wednesday. Offering a wary market outlook, Tepper said that while he suspects the bottom might already be in, there are simply too many areas in this market that are way too overvalued. And the legendary trader predicted more chaotic trading ahead and speaking specifically about the NASDAQ, which has been on a surprising tear as just a handful of tech stocks carry the entire market. Tepper said the overvaluations were some of the worst he's seen since 1999 the heyday of the dot-com bubble. Tepper even acknowledged that many of the tech stocks, which he still holds, stocks with arguably the best earnings prospects post-crisis are, quote, fully valued. Stocks tumbled on Tepper's comments as traders ignored the president's advice to ignore rich Wall Street traders. Yep. There you go, Trump. You can't prop this market up with your own bullshit by yourself when people are contradicting you on the cable networks you so slavishly watch. So there's the chart. Thank you, CJ. The bigger point here is that, yes, one comment leads to this. I, you know, I, I'm not here to give you personal financial advice, but I, I, whatever you can learn from this, first of all, I will give personal financial advice. I mean, the main thing is whenever the, if you have the cash available, diversify into things that are for basic survival cushions, whatever is appropriate for you. I have a thousand dollars set aside in metals. I wish I had the same in crypto. And I, I think that as, as a basic goal, you know, to have a few hundred dollars set aside in two completely different media that are not uh, media. I love that word. Uh, two hits very, very broadly, Apple, but to, to have you know, a, a safety buffer in two completely different things, you know, aside from that, then it's you have survival gear, you know, have ammo, have something that you can trade. Beyond that, what you do is is sort of speculative. Right now, I would say don't be in the stock market as a matter of principle, but also a matter of safety. And, and cryptos as a long term investment. Absolutely. But I would never tell you put more into cryptos than you can afford to lose because it is not a stable enough system yet. Unless you do a lot of work and you see it as a long term investment. And for those of you who do. Thank you for being a part of the shift to free market money and freeing us from this financial tyranny. So, you know, buy Bitcoin, buy crypto, invest in it. Uh, it's it's it is volatile and it is subject to manipulation. I would never tell you as a means of personal financial advice to build your dreams and plans on crypto. We've seen a lot of people uh, step on their own dick, so to speak, in, in the crypto world, over counting what they're. Uh, what what their profits were going to be, assuming that the the curve of, of Bitcoin's increase would be uh, continuous and uninterrupted. I do believe that crypto is the future. That that investing in that one way or another is absolutely critical. So beyond what you need for a safety buffer, get involved. Figure out you know Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Figure out a way to do it. I, I wouldn't advise, especially right now, keeping it on an exchange. At least have it on an independent wallet if you can get to some other kind of cold storage or or something else. You know, go with that. So I hope that wraps up our two part series of the Adam versus the man economic analysis of how you're getting ripped off by the coronaphobia crisis, by the forced unemployment crisis, as it would be more accurately described. And today is Thursday, May 14, 2020. Another long intro there. Hope the comment uh, crowd has enjoyed it. Ladies and gentlemen, in the studio, comment Jim Freedom. Hey, hey. All right. Yeah, we got. Uh... YouTube is actually exploding right now with their own little conversation. So it's been a challenge sort of <laughs> keeping up and filtering out which ones are their own conversations and which ones are trying to get to you. you know? Excellent. So, hey, do what you do, you know. Uh, first of all, yep, that's, that's what Super Chats are for. Thank you, CJ. The noise, yeah. <laughs> so first you started with the who got their money question. And there were a few comments pertaining mm. to that. Somebody mentioned... Uh, way ocean i won't accept the check it's just a tax credit that depreciates the money in your pocket and makes the bank a ton of money so that's her no take it no this is so wrong take it take it and this is this is this is really like 
I, I shared something on on Twitter the other day. Um, and I, oh, I wish I could remember the guy's name. He's another former Marine who does a, a business helping people pay less in taxes. And he wrote a piece that, that's gone viral on Twitter called, uh, well, I think it's just that he's had it up on his profile for a long time, but thousands of retweets. And it's why you have a patriotic and moral duty to pay as little in taxes as possible. That means you also have a moral and patriotic duty to take as much money from government as you possibly can, as long as you're not encouraging them or helping them or supporting them, take more money in doing so. And generally you're doing the opposite because when you let government keep that money, it's more money that they can use to hurt innocent people. So take it. Uh, if you don't, your, your dollar will still be devalued by, by other people spending that. Um, it, it's it, the, the best thing you can do if, if you really want to take, you know, an absolutist moral position here of not wanting to even hold or those dollars or, or, or use them, then trade them out for crypto or metals immediately. Right. You know, but don't, don't let the government take that. Don't let the government keep that money, please. Thank <laughs> you.